Well, good morning, everybody. I'm really glad to see you here. I've been looking forward to being with you all, all week long. Uh, Sunday, absolutely the best day of the week as far as I'm concerned, and you all make it that way for me. Thanks so much for being here. My name is David Emmert. I'm one of the pastors here at Celebration, and if you're a guest, just really hope that you've enjoyed worship already. Uh, we're going to spend some time in the Word. Hopefully, that's going to be beneficial for you. We really do hope that when we uh, spend time together looking into the Bible together, that we leave here a little differently than we came in, right? And so that's our objective this morning. Uh, we're in the middle of a sermon series called Extraordinary Church, and it's basically sort of a deep dive uh, into what it means to be a part of a church that's amazing, that's really great, that is extraordinary, and the Bible talks about this to us from a great chapter of Scripture, Romans chapter 12. If you've got a Bible with you, open it to Romans 12. If you don't have a Bible with you, no worries, in front of you, the robe beneath the seat down there, you'll find a, a Bible down there on that little rack. And you can pull that one out. Maybe it's to the left or the right of you, whatever. Uh, but take that Bible, use it for the day, take it home, give it to a friend. We just want to know that Bible is being put to use. You can also follow along on your favorite Bible app. And if you don't have one, uh, download our church app. And there you'll notice a link for the Bible. You can click on it and find Romans chapter 12. Romans 12 is just one chapter of a letter that is written by a man named Paul to a church in the city of Rome uh, back in the days of the early church. Paul was a tremendous scholar, tremendous theologian, and tremendous leader, and he's influenced the way that we understand Christ tremendously, much of the New Testament that we have. Uh, Paul was the author of much of that scripture, so he's an important person to us for that reason. Uh, we said the other day that God, through the power of the Holy Spirit, God is raising up totally committed Christ followers, and then through those totally committed Christ followers, he is building the, an extraordinary church. And if you're wondering, well, what does a totally uh, committed Christ follower look like, Romans 12 verses 1 through 8 sort of lay that out for you. You can go back and, and read those verses, but that's where we've been the last couple of weeks. We said that a totally committed Christ follower is someone who has presented themselves as a living sacrifice. That's the word from scripture. And know that that's a little bit different language than what we're accustomed to using. And so we embrace the idea of the word of totally committed Christ follower to kind of drop in there. And we uh, used as an illustration of that type of, type of total commitment an, an Olympic athlete, right, who is completely dialed into winning in their sport, and it's, their whole life is given to it. I mean, they move to the Olympic Village in Colorado, everything they eat, uh, every bit of exercise they do, how they spend their day studying and preparing, it's all geared toward winning the competition. And we said that a totally committed Christ follower is that way. That's what it means to live as a living sacrifice. It all becomes about uh, God's word, God's mission, and God's people. That's what consumes the heart and life of a totally committed Christ follower. And when we become that person, God then goes to work in our life. He transforms us, and the Bible says he renews our mind, okay? He changes the way that we begin to think. He changes the way that we begin to think about ourselves, right? We don't think ourselves too highly. We don't think of ourselves too lowly. We begin to understand that we're fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. That's an exciting thing to remember and be reminded of. And we realize, man, God has gifted me. He's given me abilities and capacities and talents. And I'm to use those to advance the cause of Christ through an extraordinary church. And then last week, we said that it's the hallmark of those totally committed Christ followers to love other people and to love so with real transparency, without hypocrisy, with real, real sincerity. And we looked at that, and we, we kind of had two illustrations up here, or three actually, but two that really kind of stuck out, one that stuck out a lot to you all, and that was the milk, right? Because the Bible says that you should be, you should detest what is evil. Do you all remember this? Detest what is evil and be glued to what is good. And we said that the idea of detesting evil is like encountering rancid milk. And by the way, you all, you won the award for the facial expression of the day uh, because, man, you all, when I acted like I was going to drink that milk, y'all were priceless. It was fantastic, okay? Now, we said that you might not think about detesting evil and clinging to good as being something loving, but it's incredibly loving, isn't it? Wives, just think about it right now. Wouldn't it mean the world to you if you knew without a doubt that your husband detested what is evil and was glued to what is good? 
Wouldn't you see that as loving? Absolutely you would. And so it's one of the most loving things that we can do to make sure that our love is authentic, that it's without hypocrisy. Now let me tell you where we're going over the next couple of weeks. Over the next couple of weeks, we're gonna kinda do a deep dive into what it means to show love to other people. Because I would submit to you, a lot of us get into real trouble in our relationships because we don't know how to show love. You know, maybe we grew up in a home that wasn't terribly loving, or maybe somehow that process in us got a bit stunted, and we don't really understand what it means to show love, and so certainly not within the context of a church. And so over the next few weeks as we move on through Romans 12, we're going to do kind of a deep dive there and learn what it means to show love. And I would submit this is helpful at home, it's helpful here in church, it's helpful anywhere where being loving is critical, and that's certainly any place where there are relationships, okay? You got it? So you should have your Bibles open to Romans 12 by now. We're going to be in verse 10 today, just one verse, two sentences long. That's where we're going to spend our time today, and let's go ahead, let's pray together, and then let's get going, okay? Lord, we love you. We're grateful for all that you do in our life, the way that you pour your love out on us. We thank you for all the many ways that you give us gifts and how you treat us. You've gifted us with so many things. Most importantly, the gift of your son, Jesus Christ. And we also thank you for the gift of your word. We pray, Lord, that as we invest in it, as we look at it today, you'll use it to change our heart. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, so just one verse today. Here it is, Romans 12, verse 10. Let's read it together. Show family affection to one another with brotherly love. Outdo one another in showing honor. Okay, so just two sentences here to kind of get this ball rolling, and we learn that sincere love, love that's not hypocritical, love that's transparent, is best described as the kind of love that exists in a healthy, loving family. Some of you all grew up in that home. I mean, your family, you were those kinds of people, it was like you were just glued to each other everywhere you went. You were just, you were, the whole family was always together. You did things together. You enjoyed the same things. There was laughter in your home nonstop. It was just crazy good. And you grew up in that very healthy family. Others of you, for different reasons, maybe your home wasn't that way. And maybe when you encountered a family that was like that, you could feel a little bit of jealousy kind of welling up inside. I get that. Uh, many of you all know my story. You know that both my mom and dad were gone by the time I was, a, uh, by the time I was 13. So I, when I was around those really healthy families uh, as a teenager, I could, I'd feel a little bit of jealousy. I lived for a while with the family, the Hayes family. They were fantastic. And the dad, Jack was his name, he worked swing shifts. You all know what that is, right? So he spent a week on days, a week on evenings, and then a week on midnights, and then he got a week off, and then he'd repeat. Now, that would kill me if I had to work that way, okay? He loved it. And in the summertime, when school schedules weren't a big deal, the whole family with, got on that schedule with him. And so when he would work evenings, he'd get home around midnight or so, and they were all up and ready to go. And they would be up at 2, 3 o'clock in the morning laughing and clowning around and, you know, playing board games and eating and all this kind of stuff. And I'm living with these people, Okay. And I'm like, you all are killing me, man. Go to bed. What is wrong with you people? It's like, dad's home, you know, 3 a.m. We're rolling. We're just getting started. And they'd all come to bed 4 or 5 o'clock in the morning. I'm up. And I'm like, hey, let's go. And then they're all like, shut up, go to bed. What are you doing, right? You're on the wrong schedule. This family, they did everything together. It was a wonderful, loving family. And the Bible says that's what you want your church to be like, okay? You want to demonstrate that kind of family love, that kind of brotherly love. You want to be showing that to everybody inside the context of your church. So if you think about it, you look around this room right now, and as you do, you should be thinking, would I do for that person? If they were in need, would I do for that person what I would do for my own mother, my own father, my own sister, my own brother? And you know your heart's in the right place when the answer to that question is, yeah, I would. You all know my story. I mentioned it just a moment ago that uh, by the time I was 13, both my mom and dad were gone. My dad died when I was eight. My mom died when I was 13 in a house fire, okay? Destroyed everything that we had. And that made an obviously a huge impact on me. But one of the things that impressed me coming through that was the way that my church family came around me in those days. I'd lost everything that I had in the house fire. I never spent one day wondering about where my clothing was gonna come from. 
I literally was reduced to the clothes on my back. The next morning, the morning after the house fire, a thoughtful woman from our church showed up at the, the door of the family with whom I was staying, knocked on the door and go, here, here's some jeans, a shirt, and underwear. I loved it when this total stranger of a woman to me bought me underwear. That was just weird, right? Okay, but she said, here it all is. This will get you through the next couple of days. And then a bunch of the ladies from the church came along and they all took me shopping after that, right? To make sure that I always had clothes. I was never homeless even though we'd lost our house because that church family came around me. And you all, they weren't just saying things like, hey, why don't you come stay at our house for a day or two? It was, why don't you come and live with us? And you'll just be part of our family. You just roll in with us. And I, I, I had a dozens of offers like that, you all. I mean, I literally, here I am, I've lost my home, my family, and I've got options. I'm like, do I want to live with you? <laughs> no. Do I want to live with you? Oh, yeah, yeah, there we go. So, I mean, it was amazing, right, to have this wonderful church family come and just serve up options like that for me. I never did without a dime, okay? One of my uh, members, my church Christian friends was a guy named Mike, and Mike came up to me right after my parents died. Mike was a, um, he drove a forklift at a lumber yard. He could go in reverse faster than anyone I've ever seen in my life, okay? It was unbelievable how fast a man could go in reverse. So he's working at a lumber yard. They don't make a lot of money, would you all agree? And he comes up to me and he says, hey, I know that cash flow is gonna be tricky, so here, and he handed me an envelope with $500 in it. I was just blown away. He said, I, you need more, you let me know. That is the way that a family loves. Would you all agree? And that was my church family. That's where, the way I grew up. And you all, I, here's what I love about celebration. I don't have to look all the way back to when I was a kid to see that kind of love being demonstrated in a church family. I see it right here all the time. When I see a member of our church family in need, I see other church members coming around them and meeting those needs in incredible ways. And it's not just when times are tough. Very often on Sundays after church, Pam and I will go out to eat. You can do that when you're an empty nester. Yeah, it's a beautiful thing. And we go out and we go and grab something, and grab a bite. We'll walk into a restaurant and there's all this whole elongated table of celebration people. And they're just laughing and cutting up and having a great time. What are they doing? They're acting like family. The Bible says, listen, if you're gonna see your church be extraordinary, it's gotta be that kind of place. It's gotta have that kind of love. And it makes you wonder if it's so amazing and so great, why is it that as you look around from church to church across the United States, why is it you don't see that kind of love more often? Why is it so scarce and why is it so rare? And I would submit to you it's scarce and it's rare because it's incredibly costly to love that way. It interferes with your schedule. It'll mess with your plans. It does a number on your life. And so a lot of people are reluctant to put themselves out there and love that way. And the Bible talks about just how costly it is. Look at 1 John 3, 16. This is how we have come to know love. He, that's Jesus, laid down his life for us. We should also lay down our lives for who? For our what? Our brothers. Now, by the way, that's not gender exclusive language. What he's saying there is we should love each other like what? Like family. Verse 17, if anyone has this world's goods and sees his brother in need but, choose, but closes his eyes to his need, how can God's love reside in him? Little children, we must not love with word or speech, but with truth and action. This is how we will know we belong to the truth and will convince our conscience in his presence. What does this passage teach us? It says, hey, we get it. Loving other people like they're your family is costly, it's difficult, it's hard. But if you really want a good indicator, a good litmus test about whether or not you're a Christ follower, just look at how you love. If you're loving your church family like they're your family, well, that's a pretty good indicator that things are on track. I gotta tell you, as I worked on this, I kinda had to do a bit of a gut check, you know? I'm often very informed as I prepare to preach, I gotta tell you. 
I'll come across something. I go, okay, is this something that I do well? Is this something I do poorly? What do I need to adjust in here, you know? And as I came across this passage, I just had to do a deep dive and I had to ask myself, am I loving my church family like they're my brothers and my sisters? You know, do I bring my talents, my capacities, my abilities, do I bring them to bear? And do I see them as essential tools to help my church family be better? Because the Bible says that, that's the real test, okay, about whether or not I love. Take a look at the, the verse again. Go back to Romans 12, 10. It says, showing family affection to one another with brotherly love. We just did that part. Then look at the next little piece of it. Outdo one another in showing honor. Just enjoy that first word there for a moment, outdo. Okay? Does that indicate to you that it's like a competition? Yeah, it does. Absolutely it does. Okay, so go back to our illustration that we used just a moment ago about how being a totally committed Christ follower is like being a high-end Olympic athlete, right? It's all about winning the race, everything, how I sleep, how I eat, how I exercise, it's all about winning the race. Y'all remember that? We just talked about that just a moment ago. Now we come to this verse, it says, outdo, in other words, outcompete others in loving. In other words, when it comes to showing love and when it comes to honoring those around us, we need to work on getting there first, okay? So it's a competition. The game is on, and I'm trying to show you honor before you can show me honor. How cool is that, okay? My wife and I work pretty hard on doing this inside of our marriage, by the way. This is an area where I think our marriage has some real strength. We are constantly trying to outdo the other person in the way that we serve each other. So uh, for me, on my part, it all begins first thing in the morning. I get up early. My wife would sleep until noon if she could. I'm just going to be honest. I'm going to tell on her right there. She is not a morning person at all. I am. I bound out of the bed in the morning, 5 a.m. Let's talk. Let's party. You know, let's go. Let's, and she's like, shut up. Go away. You know, okay. So I shut up and I go away. That's what I do. Okay. But then, as you all know, I always bring her iced tea in the morning. My wife is an iced tea addict, and I feed and fuel that addiction with all of my heart, okay, because I love my wife. And so every morning I go up, I get some iced tea, I put it into her big turvis thing, and I put it right by her sink so that when she wakes up, there's already tea right there. And most of the time, I make that tea, and I know my wife's favorite recipe for tea, okay? It's a lemon, it's two slices of ginger root, it is two green tea bags, one black tea bag, and that's it, and you let it steep overnight. That's how she likes her iced tea, okay? I just got this down. And so I make that, I got it ready to go, she's all set up, right? And then throughout the day, I'm just looking for ways that I can outdo her, okay, in showing her honor. So I go old school. I'm always about opening the car door. If she goes and she gets in the car and I didn't get to open the car door, I'm like mad at her. I'm like, really? How did you do that to me? You know, well, you were taking too long. Well, too bad. Just stand by the car and wait. Don't be, don't be cutting me off like that. I'm busting it trying to get over there to open the door for you. Don't, 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 mm -mm. don't be doing that, right? I do all that kind of stuff for my wife. I try to go old school. If my wife is in the middle of a chore and she leaves the room, I like slip in there and finish the chore real quick and then go sit back down, you know? And she comes in, hey, what happened to the chore, right? I'm, like, oh, I'm sorry, what chore, what was that? Uh, got you, you know, okay? Now here's the fun part, okay? She is doing the same thing for me all the time. She's trying to outdo me in showing honor. So it's this constant race to the top. And it doesn't matter how inconvenient it is. I know I can count on my wife to be there. A couple of weeks ago, I'm out riding my bike. You guys know that I like to ride a bike. And I'm out way out in Jeff County. I'm like 15 miles or so from the house. And my bike, it, it has a mechanical failure, okay? It breaks down. Now, I enjoy cycling, and cycling gear, the stuff you wear, is intensely practical. But in my opinion, it ain't the best looking stuff you've ever seen, okay? I mean, looking at a grown man in spandex, nobody's idea of a win, right, okay? So here I am, I'm in Jeff County, I'm right next to a cow pasture, I'm not making this up. Cows are like right over here by the fence, chewing their cud, going, why is he in spandex, man? That's just hard to look at. And, there, and here I am, and every bubba in a pickup truck is driving by, and I'm like, yep, here I am. <sighs> so I call my wife. 
It's my day off, but it's in the middle of her work day. I called my wife and I said, hey, first thing you want to know, I want you to know is I'm perfectly okay, not a scratch on me. I just want to be clear, no wreck, no nothing like that. Second thing, though, I'm broke down beside the road, just me and the cows. We're hanging out, and I'm 15 miles from the house. She said, no worries. I'll be right there. She just dropped everything, drove out there, picked me up. Hey, you okay? Yeah, I'm all right. All right. How's the bike? Well, you know, it's busted. You know, Is it going to be expensive to fix? Of course it's expensive to fix. Everything on this bike is expensive to fix. You know? Oh, that's okay. It's all right. Don't worry about it. It'll, it'll, we'll get it all taken care of. Get you back on the ride, ride, road and ride in no time. Wow. Did you just hear that? What was going on there? She was out doing me in honor, right? And we begin to say, well, I'm just going to make the needs of other people more important than my own. I'm moving into this zone, and I'm showing honor in a way that's biblical. And when I bump that out to the church family, man, extraordinary church starts to break out, doesn't it? Listen to how Philippians describes this. Philippians 2, verse 3, also written by Paul, by the way, just a little bit of expansion on this whole idea. Philippians 2, verse 3 says, Do nothing out of rivalry or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. What are we learning here? We're learning that an extraordinary church is driven by people who choose to humbly make the needs of other members of the family more important than their own. It's a beautiful thing, isn't it? There's another way that I can honor someone. I can honor them by making their needs more important than, than my own. I can elevate their needs. I can also, and you all, this is so huge. I can also honor them by, that, by the way that I speak to them and the way I speak about them. Think about it. No need to raise your hands. Let me just ask you. How many of y'all got into trouble this week because of something you said? How many of you all had that me and my big fat mouth moment this week, right? Wow, does it seem like those moments come around all the time? I honor people, though, when I watch what comes out of my mouth, when I speak about them or to them. Look at Ephesians 4, 29. You talk about a challenging piece of scripture. Look at this. No foul language is to come from your mouth. Can we just stop right there for a moment? According to the Bible, how much foul language should come from our mouths? None. Wow. Is that a high bar or what? Okay. Then it goes on and it just, it just grinds on us from there. But only what is good for building up someone in need. So when I speak, how, do I, how can I honor somebody with what I'm saying? By building up someone in need, right? And it goes on from here. So that it gives grace to those who hear. And don't grieve God's Holy Spirit. You are sealed by him for the day of redemption. All bitterness, anger, and wrath, shouting and slander must be removed from you along with all malice. And be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving one another, just as God also forgave you in Christ. Wow, that's a tough passage of Scripture, isn't it? And what it does is it makes it clear that you and I, as part of this body, we've got an obligation to honor one another with our words, with what we say. If you've been around church a long time, you've probably been in a church setting where you saw a church just tear itself apart with the words that people said to one another. Have you ever seen that? I've got a friend of mine in ministry right now. I spoke to him this week. I asked him, I knew his church is difficult. I said, what's been going on? He said, well, I'm managing, but it's really difficult. I said, well, you know, tell me about it. And you all, the things that people were saying to him, the things that people were saying about him were just unbelievably brutal. I'm sitting there thinking, man, I'm so glad that that kind of speech isn't present in my church family. You see, if, if I'm going to honor you, you need to know that your name is safe in my mouth, right? You need to know that if I'm talking to someone and your name comes up, I'm not going to run you down. 
I'm not going to hammer on you. I'm not going to go after your reputation. I'm not going to belittle you. You need to know that's true. You need to have that kind of confidence. You need to know that when I'm around you, the things that come out of my mouth aren't going to be things that are there to tear you down. In other words, you need to know that when you're among family, your name is safe. When you do that, when you declare, I'm going to make the people around me my words about them, it's always going to be safe. I'm always going to say things that are building them up. I'm not going to tear down their reputation. I'm not going to say things that are going to discourage them. I want you to understand that is an incredible game changer. Some of you all know by difficult experience what I'm telling you is true, don't you? Some of you have grown up in families where it's just, you're just being cut on and cut on and cut on. And that's sort of been the way you raised. If that's been your story, I want you just for a moment think about that. Think about how that left you. Think about how that made you feel. And then imagine what it would be like to be in a church family where the words that came out of people's mouths honored you. Hey, you want to show love? Outdo one another in showing honor. You want to show love? Look at other people like their family. Think about that really healthy family and say, that's how I'm going to treat you. You do that, I would submit to you all, that's actionable. That's practical. I can think back to a family that's really modeled this well, and I can say, how'd they love each other? That's how they treated each other. I'm going to take that example, and I'm going to apply it, okay? And it's not just the example of other people. I've been giving you all the greatest example of how to demonstrate love to others. I've been given the best example ever in human history on that. And you all know who I'm talking about, right? I'm talking about Jesus Christ himself. Look at what Philippians 2, remember we looked at Philippians 2, 3 and 4 just a moment ago. Look at verse 6. It says this, who, it's talking about Jesus, who existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be used for his own advantage. Instead, what did he do? Instead, he emptied himself by assuming the form of a slave, taking on the likeness of men. And when he had come as a man in his external form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even to death on a cross. Jesus Christ puts his needs, your needs rather, above his own. And he does so even to the point of death on a cross. And this same Jesus who loves you like family invites you right now to reject your own sinfulness and say, you know what, I realize I'm separated from God. I'm not yet in his family. To reject that and say, that changes today. And Jesus says, hey, listen, I will pay the penalty of your sin. I'll make it possible for you to be adopted into the family of God. What an incredibly beautiful truth that is. God's saying to you, I want you in my family. And that family begins here on earth. That family begins with this group of people as we assemble together as Celebration Baptist Church, the body of Christ, right here on this little edge of Killarney and Tallahassee in the state of Florida and the United States, right here, you and I get to live the body of Christ. And it doesn't stop here. It lasts for eternity. And as good as this body could be, as with all of the effort and energy that we might pour into it, it can't even begin to compare what our good Father has for us in eternity. And Jesus invites you to be a part of all of that. Family here, family for all of eternity. And today would be a great day for you to say, that is the family I want. And if you're willing to make that decision, I wanna invite you in just a moment, we're gonna pray together, then we're gonna worship some more. And then after that's done, service is over, I wanna invite you to come out to Fresh Start, it's that orange tent out on the runway. And I'll be there, some volunteers will be there. We would love to have a conversation with you about what it means to begin a new relationship with Jesus Christ and join that family. 
or to become a part of this church family here at Celebration, dare to talk with you. Or if we've never met before, please come by and just introduce yourself. I'd love to meet you. But don't let this opportunity to be a part of God's family pass you by. Let's pray together right now. Lord, we love you. We're so thankful for the family that you invite us to be a part of. And for some of us, we get it. We know what it's like to be a part of a great, healthy, wonderful family. We've been blessed that way. And for us to imagine what it would be like to extend that same measure of love and grace into a church body, easy for us to do. For others of us, Lord, we didn't have that blessing. We didn't have that privilege. Our family background is kind of scarred and messed up. It had real problems, real issues. Maybe it wasn't the most loving of homes. And so, Lord, if that's our story, then help us to find the resolve and the courage to say, my story here at Celebration is going to be different from that one. This is a family that I'm going to invest in. I'm going to love. I'm going to honor. So, Lord, we just pray that all across the room that people make a decision today to take an important step. Maybe it's the step to join the family of God to say, this is who I'm going to be from this point forward. I want to receive what Christ has done for me and be adopted into God's family. And for others, it's to say, I'm going to make a difference in this family called celebration. Grant us boldness, grant us courage. We love you, Lord. We pray all this in the great name of Jesus Christ. And everyone agreed and said, amen.